What's up, family? Welcome to episode three of Stack Sats of Die Trying. This is the Bitcoin show brought to you by By the Hood. I am Jimmy as always. Um, don't mind the hoodie. This is my my shadowy super curly hoodie by the hood hoodie. I would check out our merch. Um, anyway, with all that being said, um, got another episode for you. Uh, you know, Bitcoin only show, as you know. Um, shout out to all the supporters and everybody who's left me amazing feedback on the first couple episodes in this journey to, you know, have a deeper conversation about Bitcoin than we can in our normal podcast. Um, but I appreciate all the comments. Even saw someone in the streets this past weekend. So for those that were looking forward to our Friday show, we didn't have our Friday show this past Friday, had a speaking engagement. Um, and someone said, yo, man, I love your crypto show. It's not a crypto show. Sorry to tell you that. It's a Bitcoin show. But with that being said, though, I have a special episode, man. Today, I want to have a conversation about um, watching what people do and not necessarily what they say. And also, I think my overall point in today's episode is to kind of talk about how Bitcoin doesn't change, but Bitcoin changes you. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that, right? I'm going to start with this. You know what I'm saying? Get get my presentation game on. For those listening to the audio, I will read out everything. So it kind of makes sense. But here's a tweet that I saw from um, Saifedean uh, Amos, who wrote probably my favorite Bitcoin book, which is called The Bitcoin Standard. I'll put the link for that in the um, description as well as the show notes. But he put out a tweet. Here's what this tweet says. It says, a cousin of mine met with a financial advisor who explained to him his sophisticated investment products and showing him their track record. So his cousin asked the financial advisor, that's nice, but buying Bitcoin outperforms all of this and doesn't require fees or active management. The financial advisor responded to him, good point. To be honest, that's what I do with my own money, but it's my job to sell these strategies, right? (laughs) So here you have Someone literally, you know, being honest, saying, yo, I'm trying to sell you all this stuff, but that's not what I do with my money. I do this. Um, And you have to be careful and watch what people do and not what they say. Because, you know, one of the reasons why I let my licenses go in terms of um, in the past, I've had a securities license and insurance license. One of the reasons I let that go in my journey um, was because of literally this. I was told to sell people things that wasn't necessarily the best product for them. Um, it was what was best for the company. And it didn't sit right with me to the point where I let the entire license go. Just take the whole thing. So um, this happens. So a lot of times I cringe when people who probably don't even need a financial advisor hire one. And I like to ask him, is it a fiduciary? Is it not? Because um, their incentives may not align with yours. So this is an example of this, but this got me just to thinking in general, right? And let me think about this um, slide I saw from one Alex Gladstein, uh, who is a human rights activist. And he has this saying that there are four critics of Bitcoin, right? So the first critic is someone which is known as a salty hater. And I'll explain to you what that means. And if you're listening, um, I'm just showing a slide where it says the four critics of Bitcoin. I'm going to read what each critic is called and what that means. So the first critic is a salty hater. This is someone that heard about Bitcoin years ago, but never bought it. And now they're just salty. So they're a critic of Bitcoin because they kind of heard about it early and took no action. The second critic is a desperate status, right? They believe that money can only be created by the state. So Bitcoin breaks their worldview. I'm going to stop here for a second. Here's why. These are the people that I run across the most. It's difficult to change the paradigm or the framework in which you understand money. Um, And and in which you understand government, because believe it or not, and it's going to sound crazy to a lot of our audience, a lot of people still believe the government has their best interest at heart, right? Instead of just operating a system and chugging along and doing what they can just to keep that system operating. Um, And because of that, they believe the government is the only person that has the power or authority to give anything value. Um, And it's difficult for them to see anything outside of that framework. And I run across this pretty much every day. So now the third critic is someone called the dishonest intellectual. This is someone who hasn't done the work to understand Bitcoin. So they just wish it would go away. They're tired of hearing about it. They they don't even want to do the research. They're just like, look, I'm just tired of hearing about this thing. Let's let it go away. So they're a dishonest intellectual. And the fourth critic is the prisoner of sunk costs. 
So this is someone who's invested in an uh, altcoin or like I say, shit coin, and they feel the need to criticize Bitcoin, you know, just to defend their life choices. So those are the four critics of Bitcoin. But getting to my overall point in this video is, right, you have people who are doing things um, or trying to tell you to do things that they don't do themselves, probably because they're, you know, um, they're, they're looking out for their own incentives in terms of trying to make money. And then you have the four critics of Bitcoin. But the thing about Bitcoin is none of this matters. And I've said this several times. Technology does not have feelings and it doesn't care. It's going to continue to move forward. And what it's going to do is it's going to change you. It's not going to make you change it. And that's exactly what happens all the time in Bitcoin. Here's a tweet from a gentleman um, named Nick Huber. He says, the main reason I'm a Bitcoin bear is because I bought 30 Bitcoins at $200 and I sold them at 220 and I'm jealous. There I said it, right? At least he's being honest, right? He's telling you why he's out here being a Bitcoin bear. It's because he bought it at 200 and sold it at 220. I think about this. I'm not going to do the math for you, but he had 30 Bitcoin. What would those 30 Bitcoin have been in 2024 um, with Bitcoin being over $50,000 per? You can do the math there. And that's why, you know, he is a Bitcoin bear. Now, there is um, a number of other things that I want to share with you guys. Let me uh, change the slide for a second and share with you. Um, in terms of Bitcoin, just like, again, I say this all the time. It doesn't care how you feel about it. It's going to continue to do what it does, right? And, and, and it's going to continue to move forward because it's technology. And all technology does this. I remember once upon a time where people said, you know, um, it said, I don't like Windows. Like Windows is this or Windows is that. Guess what Windows does? Windows keeps moving forward. Windows doesn't care how you feel about it. Windows is going to be what it's going to be. And it's nothing that you can do about it. And Microsoft is one of the most valuable companies, you know, in the world because of it. So I, technology does not care how you feel. Now, let me share this with you real fast. And here we go. Boom. So, as a matter of fact, and again, I, I have to preface this for those that are listening, you're going to hear, what you're going to hear now is a clip from a podcast with uh, Lex Freeman. He's talking to Ray Dalio. And just to add a little bit more context to this, Ray Dalio originally was someone um, who was, you know, um, a Bitcoin bear. He didn't necessarily believe in Bitcoin, but I want you to hear him recently speak about Bitcoin. So let me uh, share this with you guys. Well, the evolution of Bitcoin over the years is one of the things that um, influenced changes in my view. Um, it, it's proven itself. Um, something like 10, 11 years ago, imagine the programming of this. And here's the, you throw it out and that's the idea. It has not been hacked. It has um, uh, operated, it, it has built it has come an amazing way um, over that 11 years to be um, maybe uh, probably the most excited topic among a lot of people um, and has been used and, and is now um, has obtained, you know, the status of having imputed value. At the same time, it is one of those assets that is an alternative money. I think we're entering an era where um, there's going to be a competition of monies um, because of the printing of fiat money um, and the dep depreciated value. There will be a competition of monies um, and Bitcoin is part of that competition. But so <laughs> just to let you know, this guy was a Bitcoin bear and now you hear what he's saying about Bitcoin because again, Bitcoin doesn't care what he thinks. It's not going to change. Um, it's going to change him. Here's something else I want you to hear, right? And this goes against um, watching what people do and not what they say and understanding that people will always follow their own incentives, right? So you've got to understand that as you start to dive into Bitcoin and understand what it is, how it works, you're going to see a lot of um, what we call FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, but when you dig a little bit deeper and you start to see what people are actually doing with their money, 
you say, okay, you're telling me all this, but you're doing that. Here's an example that I want you to hear this as well. It's really been extremely egregious. So on September 12th, Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin is a fraud. He says he'll fire any one of his traders buying Bitcoin. Bitcoin drops 24%. When Jamie Dimon speaks, people listen, people listen. So that weekend, we found out that the largest buyer of a, of a Bitcoin fund that's in Europe, the buy <laughs> physical Bitcoin, right? The largest buyer was Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. And that's not illegal. He says it's a fraud. He says he'd buy anyone I'll the buyer. Fire. Yes. And at the same time, his company is buying. His company is buying. So you're, it's just, I mean, so unethical. Right. Okay. George Soros. George Soros, in January 24th, <laughs> price was already down. Calls Bitcoin a bubble, says Bitcoin is the worst, you know, the worst investment in the world. Don't buy Bitcoin. Don't buy Bitcoin. Basically throws uh, gasoline on the fire yeah. at this point. And then what do we find out? So he says bubble here, it drops 44%. Right. And then here in April, two months later, guess what we find out? Yeah. His $26 billion family office has approval to buy cryptocurrency. Right. And you only, we only knew about it publicly right here. Here. Okay. So then here now, Goldman Sachs, this again, February 7th, most cryptocurrencies will crash to zero. Now, I remember when they said this in February, and I had, through my network, I knew that Goldman Sachs was setting up a crypto trading desk. Absolutely knew they were setting up a crypto trading desk. And I remember you telling me that. Right. And then, uh, of course, they were denying it. No, yeah. we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. Yeah. Price falls down 27%. And then what do we find out? We find out here. Uh, they say BTC zero, and then we find out just before May, new trading desk. Not only that, they put four hundred million dollars to buy a cryptocurrency trading platform. Okay, so February seventh, oh, it's all going to zero. May, oh, we're gonna we just spent four hundred million just on a on a flyer, and they're not the only ones. No, no. Um, so you have a lot of institutions that are coming. You had put. Got to watch these folks, right? You got to watch these folks because, again, don't watch what they say. Watch what they do, right? And, I, and, and the thing is, I want to make sure I just express the overall point of episode three is that you're not going to change Bitcoin. It's going to change you. And you have to watch people um, follow their own incentives, right? So there are a number of folks where they've come around to Bitcoin after, you know, studying for a while, but a lot of people don't even take the time to study. And if you don't take the time to study, when you criticize, I don't even hear you. So on a day in and day out basis, I get a lot of criticism because I am such a, uh, you know, Bitcoin bull and believe in the technology so much that, you know, people actually seek me out and send me messages on social media to kind of criticize Bitcoin. And then I ask, you know, what kind of studying they've done. And once I realize it's none, I don't debate with anyone no more. There's no sense in debating. I'm not going to waste my time. But here's uh, a couple more things I want to add before we, you know, wrap this up. Um, Mark Cuban. Here's what Mark Cuban said about uh, Bitcoin in 2019. Here's the thing about crypto, particularly Bitcoin. Bitcoin is worth what somebody will pay for. Did you ever see someone who collected baseball cards and they were really, really, really proud of their baseball cards because they kept on saying they were going to go up in price? Comic books, same thing, even artwork. There's no real intrinsic value. You can't eat a baseball card or shouldn't eat a baseball card. Your artwork might look good on the wall, but not much you can do with it. Bitcoin, there's even less you can do with it. At least I can look at my baseball card and go, oh, that's my favorite player. That's Roberto Clemente. I can look at artwork. And go, wow. Crypto is the key that is so complicated for 99% of the population. Do you put it in a device? Do you print it out? How do you keep from being hacked? Who's going to host it for you? It's just so difficult that it's only worth what somebody will pay for. I'd rather have bananas. I can eat bananas. Crypto, not so much. Look, I can make a great argument for blockchain. There's a lot of applications and they'll be used, but you don't need public Bitcoin. Okay, now, remember, 2019, Bitcoin, he'd rather have a banana than Bitcoin. Two years later, a- this is Mark Cuban now, two years later. When it comes to crypto and blockchain and stuff, how do you feel about that? I think it's a kind of part of the future. Right. I really, really do. But I think people are looking at it the wrong way. Hmm. People get really amped up about um, the price of the currency, cryptocurrencies, right? right? The tokens. 
and they think that's really what crypto is, but it's not. That's the noise, right? The signal is, if I were going to start a business, how can I use this new technology to give myself a competitive advantage and disrupt an industry? Right. So it went from being banana or matter of fact, he said, I'd rather have a banana to now it being the future. And if you say, well, he didn't say specifically to be the future. I wanna take a look at this. Now, Mark Cuban says that 80 percent of his new non shark tank investments are in and around crypto. Oh, and by the way, of that, 60 percent of his crypto portfolio is in Bitcoin. So, again, you see Bitcoin to care less how you feel about it. Right. It's not going to change. It's going to change you. Um, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. This is from October 13th of 2017. He says Bitcoin is an index of money laundering. It's not good for anything but money laundering. Here we go in 2024. Let's hear how Larry Fink feels about Bitcoin. I believe, you know, I believe it goes up. As the, if the world is more frightened if people have had fearful of geopolitical risk. They're fearful of their own risk. Um, it's no different than what gold represented over thousands of years. It is a it is a it is a asset class that that protects you. Right. And and unlike gold, where we manufacture new gold, we're almost at the ceiling of the most of the amount of. But when that we hear created. somebody like I mean, when you hear somebody like Kathy Wood, yes, who's on our broadcast yesterday, right. say that her base case base case is that this turns into a six hundred thousand dollar a Bitcoin valuation base case. And a, a you know million plus um, in a in a super optimistic case. Are you anywhere in her realm? I haven't thought about it. I, I, to me, that what we are trying to do is offer uh, an instrument uh, that can uh, that can store wealth. I think if it gets that even close to that high, gold will represent even a bigger value. And, 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 and let's be clear: if you think of digital gold, there's going to be a reference point between gold and Bitcoin. Now. <laughs> Again, as you see, I, it, it went from it went from um, being something just used for money laundering to now it's digital gold, right? So now it's digital gold. It's a store of value. 2017, he said it was only good for money laundering. Now it's digital gold. Bitcoin didn't change. It changed him, right? And also gives him the ability to be completely honest, right? This is what I mean by incentives, right? They created the ETF through BlackRock, which I'm not actually against believe it or not a lot of bitcoin maxis and people feel like you know and, and i will say this though i do believe that um spot bitcoin your own bitcoin and your own wallet is way more powerful and valuable than anything else but i'm not against the etf and the reason why is because it gives me the alternative to now in my retirement accounts i'm able to stack more paper sats so to speak so when i'm all in on bitcoin i'm all in so my my you know my money that's in the market so to speak is there and um, but I spend most of my time trying to stack my own sacks. But the point is, you see how people change their mind over time. So some of the people that will tell you today that it's worthless, that it's nothing, doesn't matter. Because what I know is all roads lead to this asset. And I know in a couple of years, they'll probably be on camera saying something completely separate. So always keep that in mind. And by the way, I have pages and pages of other folks um who are in high positions who have done the same 180 um as it pertains to bitcoin so i just wanted to make this episode to kind of like you know really show you guys that um you got to be careful out here be careful about what people say watch what they do and understand that you don't have to change anyone's opinion if you are already a bitcoin bull and you're all in or whatever it may be don't even worry about changing people's minds or perspectives because it's going to happen anyway it's going to happen anyway. Bitcoin doesn't change. It changes you. I want to repeat that. Bitcoin doesn't change. It changes you. Anyway, this has been another episode of Stack Sats at Die Trying. Thank you guys for coming along this journey to have more of these Bitcoin conversations. I'm working on some guests for future episodes right now. Um, you know, just kind of get a lot of things out of the way as we continue to, you know, um, create more content surrounding Bitcoin for our channel. And... And if you are listening to the audio, I hope you enjoyed the audio experience. Make sure to leave us reviews, however, or wherever you listen to this episode. I appreciate you guys. Also, send some questions, concerns, things that you want to know. I did get a couple of messages of uh, people asking to, you know, talk about wallets. And I will do that. I'm putting that together now. Um, talk about wallets, 
to uh, you know talk about the best places to buy. Those are some of the kind of feedback that I got. Um, but as always, I'm, I'm you know going to be creating a lot of content around this. So you know every week you'll get something new. But I appreciate you guys nonetheless. Um, and remember, stack sats or die trying. Peace. Bye.